group of kids today. Matthew 9. exciting portion of Matthew that we're in now. It is where we get to see what Jesus did, a snapshot, on a daily basis. So, it's sort of like, if you can actually imagine, if you have the imagination to go along with it, it's, it's sort of like the opportunity uh, to watch the video of Jesus in His daily action in His earthly ministry. Now, I'll remind you of something that uh, is worth noting. First of all, Jesus' ministry was about three and a half years. I, that's just incredible, isn't it? That the ministry that Jesus worked with the world, the things that Jesus came to do and the things that He accomplished in three and a half years were absolutely amazing. I can't imagine just how much Jesus did. John described the things that Jesus did this way. He said that the these, he said the, the works that Jesus did, if they were written in a book, I suppose that the whole world could not contain the books that should be written. That's a high level of activity. If you were to document what Jesus did, analyze it, comment on it, the world couldn't handle the books. Indeed, libraries are full of books that are just about the Bible about the things Jesus did. Can you imagine if we had every book that was written on the Gospel of Matthew? This room couldn't contain the books that would be written about the Gospel of Matthew, but when we read about Jesus, again, we're only seeing a picture or a snapshot. You know, a really great picture to me is one that tells a story, isn't it? You ever see a picture? I mean, Norman Rockwell was probably one of the most famous American painters, and what was it about Norman Rockwell's paintings that made them just so iconic? It was the fact that when you had just a still picture of a person, there was so much activity going on in the picture. So much is happening in a picture. You ever see a picture like of the man painting himself and looking in the mirror, he's, he's making a portrait of himself, and he's in the mirror making... I mean, this picture just tells a whole story. It's just hilarious, isn't it? When you look at it, it makes you laugh. You just see just so much activity. And to a much greater extent, the Gospels are a snapshot or an animated picture telling you what Jesus did, but the idea is this is, what Jesus, this is who Jesus was. 
So the gospel is who Jesus was. Jesus is the gospel, and anything about Jesus is gospel because Jesus is the gospel. Do you understand that? Matthew 9, verse 1. Let's read a couple of uh, verses. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, and saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he <coughs> excuse me, arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Now look down with me to verse 11, will you please? The Bible says, When the Pharisees saw it, and this is where Jesus was eating, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Father, I pray that you would help us to understand what that means. And help us to understand who Jesus is and why Jesus came from this picture of an example of what Jesus did. We pray for your help and guidance now. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a great story, isn't it? If you were to read Mark chapter 2, you would see almost identical wording, but perhaps additional detail to what Jesus did here in this instance. So Mark chapter 2 tells the same story with the additional information that when the friends of the man who was sick with the palsy came and they brought him, they couldn't get close or near to Jesus where he was in the house because of the press. In other words, there were so many people pressed around that they couldn't access Jesus and so they made a hole in the roof and let him down to Jesus. And I don't know how many times in my lifetime I've preached the Mark chapter 2 passage, but quite a few actually. Because the reality of it is, is that the inclusion as one of the first miracles that Jesus did in Mark's gospel, and the inclusion as one of the first miracles that Jesus did in Matthew's gospel, or if you'll think of it from this perspective, this, this miracle being included when there were literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of miracles that Jesus did. It's notable. You ever think of um, what to report on? Sometimes I'll say something like this to my wife. I'll say, there must, not, there must be some major event going on right now that the media doesn't want to report on because of the insignificant thing that's being reported. Now, this is not insignificant. I'm not making light of what happens to any individual. Please don't understand me. Remember, I'm nice this year, so you don't have to wonder if there's some hidden meaning or some sarcasm behind it. So there's nothing nothing intended uh, to be unkind. I'll just say I don't intend to sound unkind. But the last, last week, we've seen a lot of reporting on how many people, not just in the United States, but worldwide, have died of the flu. And I think in the United States, it's something like 28 people now. I may be wrong. That may be the UK number. The UK, I think, has something like 54 people who have died of the flu this year. and But this year, like 28 people have died of the flu, and, and I think two or three of them were under the age of 50, which is unusual. Or it puts them in a class of their own. Remember last week there was a guy who was, you know, he, they called him a bodybuilder. He was an amateur weightlifter, uh, trainer. Uh, and you know, everybody thought he was very healthy, and he died of the flu. Then there was a high school teenager, and I want to say he was in California, and... She had the flu, and, and uh, they're trying to say it was misdiagnosed. It wasn't. She just, the bacteria from it, uh, she went into some type of septic shock, and she died of the flu. And each of these individual events, because individuals are of infinite worth and value to God, they're significant. 
But let me ask you a question. How many years, uh, how often every year do people die of the flu? Do you realize it happens every single year? Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, I tried to do a comparison last week just for fun, but then I ran out of time and I didn't finish. But I want to say that the numbers this year are actually down, even though they're being heavily reported as the news event last week. The mudslides in California and the flu. They're major news events last week until Donald Trump uh, was quoted as saying something, the way he phrased it, being really you know, distasteful and so forth. So you, it's kind of like, in my opinion, the media waits for Donald Trump to do something that they can report on, and in between they have filler material. And usually, though, the filler material, I, I'm not being silly. Remember, I'm not funny this year, so, Ms. Stallings, I'm not funny. Don't laugh at me, okay? Uh, usually, the filler material actually isn't just putting material in because there's nothing to report on. Usually, it's because they don't want to report on major worldwide events. Let me just ask you a practical question. How big of the news, how big of a deal is it that someone dies? I'm not talking about on an individual micro level, but I'm just asking you on, on an individual level, how big of an event is it when someone dies? For that person and in their circle, it's a big deal. But from a national or a world perspective, it happens every single day. Matter of fact, this month, uh, I know 10 people that died. People that I know died. Ten people I know died this month. That's a lot, isn't it? You know, none of those were on the news. So what I'm saying is, I'm not diminishing, I'm not, I don't want you to be offended by the way I put it. What I'm saying is what's reported uh, is either significant because it's bigger. Like Tosh said, it depends on the person that dies. I mean, if one of the godless hellions from Hollywood dies... You know, we write tributes and make a big deal out of it. And the fact is, is that people die all the time, do they not? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying it's not a big deal. That's not my point. It's what's reported. Okay, now on a serious perspective, we don't have to suspect that the writers that the Holy Spirit used to pen the gospel have some subversive, undermining purpose in reporting the gospel of who Jesus is, do we? They're pretty straightforward. John tells you these are written that ye may know, that ye may believe, and that ye may know. Whereas I'm writing these things, I'm telling you these things so that you can believe in Jesus and that you can know that He's the Christ, the Son of God. So he's pretty forthright about what he's writing. A person who doesn't want to know that Jesus is God had better not read John. <laughs> right? I mean, he states what he what he says. He states his premise in the beginning, and if you don't want if you don't want to know that Jesus is God, you better not read John. And the same would be true of Matthew. The same would be true of Mark. And the same would be true of Luke. All of them writing from a different perspective, but all of them writing about who Jesus <coughs> is, and being influenced by the Holy Spirit of God to report the particular events that show us the gospel of who Jesus is. Now, I spent a lot of time on that this morning because. Uh, anytime you preach in the Gospels, you want to have the opportunity just to talk about the Gospels and, and actually have an understanding of what they are. See, it's really important for us to realize that what Matthew reported on with regard to the miracles that Jesus did is significant enough for it to be a good representation of the thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of things Jesus did which would be difficult to report. I'm trying to be nice, but I have one last illustration to point out what I'm saying. So I want to say this very nicely. Missionaries' prayer letters, to me, are always really ironic. And what's ironic about them, actually, is that I have to write prayer letters myself. About four times a year, I write reports to different churches that support church planting. They supported this church when it began. They helped support Miami Beach Baptist Church to a degree. And they just made the decision. They, we didn't call and ask them to support. They just said, we want to support, we want to help with the church planting that Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church does. And so I write prayer letters. And I want to just tell you something. It's tough for me to write a prayer letter because what is in a prayer letter is normally this is what happened. 
this is what God is doing, this is what's going on. And the reality that I think of when <coughs> I write the letter is that this kind of thing happens every single day. It's not really news. When I, get, when I read missionary letters, they talk about going to the store, encountering a stranger, and having the chance to share the gospel with them, pray for this person that he gets saved. And I think I do that every single day. What's so special about that? It's not that significant, right? I, now, I know why the poor missionaries do this, because they're required to write prayer letters to give updates on their ministry. And glamour work, doing the work of the ministry in and of itself, normally it just isn't very glamorous. And so they have to kind of gloss up little stories or events or make a big deal out of something that isn't a great big deal. And I just want to tell you something. This passage of Scripture we're looking at today doesn't fit in that category. This is actually a really big deal. It's actually big news. A couple of reasons. We know that. First, it's in God's Word, and it's the most important, significant book which has ever been written. And it's unlike any other book which has been written because it's God's Word. In other words, this is a supernatural book. The Bible isn't just the most sold book that was ever written, my friend. It's a book that's unlike any other book which was written. It's not merely a religious book. It is God's Word. And every word in it, the Bible says, is preserved, and it's inspired, and it is profitable for doctrine. Now, I spent a long time introducing our topic because the prophet that we find actually won't take that much time today. I'm not using filler material in the message this morning, but I do want us to understand that the truth which is taught is very representative of Jesus in general. In other words, the purpose statements that Jesus makes in the two passages we read in Matthew chapter 9 this morning encapsulate, they summarize, they really just help us to understand this is who Jesus is, this is why Jesus came. So if the question this morning is, who is Jesus and why did Jesus come? Matthew's Gospel explains those, using an illustration of what Jesus did to show why he came. The first thing that happens is that there's this man which is sick of the palsy. In today's medical terms, what we would say about this person would be that maybe we wouldn't actually have a... <coughs> a um, medical term besides palsy. Palsy could be a lot of things, but it was a debilitating, a physically debilitating sickness that wasn't mentally debilitating. This man is all there mentally, but physically he has not the ability to even move himself. He uh, is maybe uh, quadriplegic or paraplegic, but probably not. He just doesn't have control of his muscles, and all he can do is lay in a place and lay in place, and he has a debilitating physical uh, physical uh, hindrance, if you want to call it that. Uh, one of the things that is always remarkable to me is what Jesus did when they came to him. We know from Mark's account that this man, when he came to Jesus, they couldn't get near to him because of the crowd or the press, so they led him through the roof. Look at verse 2 with me, if you will, please. And let's look to right after the colon, where the Bible says, And Jesus, seeing their faith, <coughs> said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. We're told about this man that when he came to Jesus, he came and was carried by his friends and we see, because he was carried by his friends, that he did not have the ability to bring himself to Jesus. And based on the statement that Jesus made, we can see that this man was not happy, or he was not of good cheer. Do you see that from the text? It's there. Jesus said, Son, be of good cheer. So he comes to Jesus, and he comes to Jesus distraught. He comes to Jesus upset. And it's not the reason that we think. See, we think because this man is described as having the palsy that his problem is his physical sickness. But when Jesus in verse 2 addresses the man, he says, first of all, he says, cheer up, because thy sins are forgiven thee. And so we see implied in the text 
we see understood that the reason the man came to Jesus was not because he had a sickness or a debilitating physical disease. The reason he came to Jesus was because he had a debilitating problem of sin. Listen to me today, my friend. Your problem, your problem is not physical so much as it is spiritual. Most of the time, when people were to tell you what their problems are, why are you upset? Why are you downtrodden? Why are you in despair? What's your problem? When people describe their problems, their answer normally will be circumstances. And this man comes to Jesus, and it is not his circumstances that he recognizes are his problem. It's that he's a sinner. Now let me ask you a question. What kind of sins is a man sick of the palsy capable of? I'm not being silly, I'm not being funny, I'm not even making fun because there's, there are a couple of answers here. The one answer is that as far as the heart goes, he's capable of any sin anyone else can commit. Right? This man who's sick of the palsy is capable of any sin anyone else can commit and perhaps is prone to be capable of mental sins that other people are not as capable of. For instance, ingratitude. Would he have an advantage when it comes to being ungrateful over a guy who has good physical ability and doesn't have anything to complain about? Would he? Would he have more of a propensity to ingratitude? Despair. It's a sin. Would he have a better shot at despair than the average fellow? Sure. So could we suffice it to say that regarding sin, this man was as capable of anyone else of being a sinner? Well, Pastor, he was helpless. He, was just, he still had the ability to sin, didn't he? Friend, a lot of times we think that physical circumstances are an excuse. And I will say for you that this man was a good example of a man who made no excuse for sin. And to come and say, well, God, you know, I wouldn't be a sinner if I didn't have this palsy. I wouldn't be bitter. I wouldn't be angry. And who knows if he even was bitter or angry. I'm not saying he was. I'm saying he was capable of that. So he did, but we do know that he did not come to Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, in good cheer. He came to Jesus in despair. And Jesus said, don't despair, be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Secondly, secondly, this man did not come to Jesus for, physically, for physical healing. He came to Jesus for spiritual healing. Friend, here's a good example. Here's a good example of just an individual looking and saying, not my will but thine. In other words, this man understood, he had enough of a life's perspective that he understood that having the physical ability to walk and carry a bed didn't matter one iota in eternity. My wife, shame on her, my wife is not impressed with physical strength. She's just not. She said, you know, the good thing about not being impressed with physical strength is I'll still like you when you're old. She says, you know, she's never impressed. I, I lift heavy things all the time to impress my wife, and she's just not impressed. Hey, hey, baby, watch me lift this piano. You're going to hurt yourself. Put that down. She's not impressed by physical strength. <laughs> it's too bad because I'm telling you, I'm so strong. I mean, uh, you know, it's just a bummer that my wife isn't impressed because, you know, when I only weighed 145 pounds, I could lift ridiculous things. When I was 145 pounds, I remember one time rolling a 350 Chevy small block of, you know, uh, a large, it, was, uh, um, it was not a short block, it was a long block. In other words, it had the heads and everything on it. And I remember uh, rolling it up onto the hood of a Chevy Caprice and pushing it through the front windshield. Uh, my dad had a uh, Chevy truck that something happened to the engine in it when my teenage brother was driving it. And I remember I was repairing that truck for my dad and... I was about 165 pounds. I took the heads off of it and I lifted the V8 uh, small block 350. I lifted it out of the 
out of the, lifted up on the truck, set it on the front. Uh, you couldn't do this on cars today, but this was a steel, uh, the front radiator support. And then I got off, backed up my little pickup, got off and lifted it from there and put it in the back of my truck. 350 Chevy small block. How much does one of those weigh? I'm not sure. It felt like a thousand pounds. It's probably only like, uh, without the heads, probably only like 600, you know, not that much. But I was only 160 pounds. That's strong, you know, and I'm still pretty healthy today in spite of that. Uh, <laughs> the reality of it is, is that my wife's just not impressed. Sometimes I'll pick her up and I'll lift her up and then she hits the ceiling fan. She doesn't like that. Uh, I don't do this in church, by the way. But uh, sometimes I'll pick her up and I'll be like, ah, like that. She's like, put me down. You get My hair's getting caught in the ceiling fan. You know, don't do this to me. Some of y'all may have seen me mess with my wife. I like to tease her a lot. But she's not impressed. I could pick Taj up and put him in the ceiling fan and she wouldn't be impressed. I have never done that with you, have I, Taj? Anthony. <laughs> Anthony did. Yeah, not me. So, anyway, doesn't impress her. You know why? Because physical strength comes and physical strength leaves. It's just something that some people have, some people don't have. Some people have too little of it, and that's a little bit uh, negative impressive. Wait, that wasn't nice, was it? Let's just scratch that statement. All right, that was not, we'll just take it off of my record with my apology for it. All right, but the fact is some people have it, some people don't have it. And the whole scheme of life, physical strength really matters about nil, except for getting things done when you need to do things. Right? I mean, it's handy. But it's nothing more than that. Matter of fact, God doesn't judge a person for having or lacking strength, does He? Not normally. Not in normal circumstances. The Bible says, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, bodily exercise profiteth little. In other words, he said there's a little profit in it, but it's not much. There's just not much there. Nothing, you know, don't make it the focus of your life, your existence. Because it'll be a waste of your existence. Okay. This man actually understood that. He had a physically debilitating circumstance, and when he came to Jesus, he wasn't upset about his physically debilitating circumstance. He was upset about his sin. Listen to me, will you please? Today, my friend, your problem isn't what you lack or what you even have that you wish you didn't. Your problem's sin. That's your problem. And you know what? It's not one of these circumstances where God is playing some silly game like He's saying you've got a problem and it's a hidden one guess. You ever see, you know, you ever do one of those gift things where you make somebody follow a list of clues to find their present, find their gift. You ever see somebody do that? It's kind of fun. You know, you wake up in the morning and there's a there's a ribbon in your room and it says follow the ribbon and you follow the ribbon and it goes down the hall, goes to the bathroom, goes into the garage, goes out of the garage, goes down the side of the house, goes in the backyard, goes back around into the house again and then all of a sudden in the living room is, you know, whatever your you know heart desires for a great gift. Uh, sometimes you go outside and it's a ribbon on the hood of a sh new Chevy pickup or something, you know. Uh, whatever it is, it's like follow this and there's a little bit of a mystery. Sometimes we do a teen activity or an adult activity because adults I think like as much as the teens where we write clues and you have to solve a clue to go to the next one. And you know, you end up sometimes it's a scavenger hunt where you go all around town at the end, you either find the person you're looking for or the pizza you're looking for or whatever it is and you you get it to clue. Let me just tell you something. When it comes to sin in your life and sin in my life, God doesn't play little scavenger hunt silly Games. He doesn't say you've got a secret sin which is hidden to you and only I know about. And it is a hindrance in your life. It's causing you all kinds of problems, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. God's not like that. God's always like this. That's wrong. It's amazing how He uses the Word of God. You're afraid to open the Bible because you know God's going to get you. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's like, open the Bible. You, you know, the, a lot of times for me it's this way. You know, I get up in the morning and it's time to read my Bible. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just being honest with you. I'm a real person, you know. I sin just like you do. And I think, yeah, forget about it. God, before I go in your word today, you and I, we need to talk about something. Mm -hmm. And I just deal with whatever it is that's going on in my life. And I just get right with God. And I'm like, okay, now I can read the Bible without it getting me. Because I know whatever I had read 
the Holy Spirit and the Word of God would just go boom and just put his finger specifically on the thing that God's working on in my life. I might as well just say, well, God, you know what? Let me just deal with it. This preaching's the same way, isn't it? You know what will happen if you don't come uh, to the services next week with your heart prepared? God will get you about your lack of preparation. He'll get you about the hindrances, the things that... I mean, he's gonna, he, God doesn't play games. This man who's sick of the palsy, my friend, isn't a... You know, I've just always done right, and I don't know why God's done this to me. I don't know why I don't have physical ability. I'm just a perfect person. But, uh, you know, my life's not perfect, and I don't, I'm don't. i going to come to Jesus and ask Him why. He's not coming to Jesus with an accusation of, God, you haven't been good in my life. He's coming to Jesus, and He's distraught. And the reason He's distraught is because of His sin. He knows it. Jesus knows it. And Jesus looks at Him and says, Be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Jesus doesn't look at the man who is sick of the palsy and think, what a poor underprivileged fellow. He looks at the man who's sick of the palsy and thinks, what a wicked fellow. But I love his attitude of wanting to get right. And he just instantly says, thy sins are forgiven thee. Then Jesus teaches the Pharisees a lesson. And this, of course, is, I believe, the reason why this is included in the Gospel because this is something that's true about Jesus that we need to know. In verse 3, the Bible says, Behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. They said, That's blasphemy. And the reason they said that is because, you know, no, only God can forgive sins. So Jesus, the Bible says, knowing their hearts, verse 4, verse 4 of their thoughts, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? And then he asked a question, which is one where I stop, you know, before I see the right answer. I'm not one of these people, you know, that. You know, you do a crossword puzzle and you hold the, you know, the back of the book open and you look at it and just fill out the answers. I'm one of the person that actually tries to, you know, find out what the word is before I cheat. You know, so when I see verse five and the questions asked, I actually want to think about it and come up with an answer before I read what Jesus said the answer is. And the question Jesus asked uh, was not a riddle, but it was a good question. He said, "Whether is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee." or arise and walk. <clears throat> and when I think about that question, I realize that, that the answer to the question really has to do with perspective. Do you, this reminds me of the passage in Ezekiel where Z, Ezekiel's in the Valley of the Dry Bones and he is asked the question, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's answer is, O Lord, thou knowest. In other words, I don't know, but you do. That's kind of where I come to an answer to the question here because the really, the question has to do with perspective. In other words, if the question is, is it easier for Charlie to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say arise, take up thy bed and walk? Well, wait a second. Which of those are you good at, Charlie? I can't do Neither. <laughs> Actually, the fact of the matter is, from Charlie's perspective, to say thy sins be forgiven thee, he has no right to say that. Because only God can forgive sins. And to say, arise, take up thy bed and walk, he cannot do that because only God can do miracles. So Jesus' question is, is it easier to do something supernatural in the sense of a physical miracle or is it easier to do something supernatural in the sense of an invisible miracle? He's really talking about physical or invisible. And I don't really know the answer to the question because Jesus doesn't actually tell us what the answer to the question is. Because when you think about the question, your conclusion actually comes to the reality that from man's perspective, both are impossible. From God's perspective, both of them are easy. And Jesus' question actually isn't which is more difficult. His question is which is easier. And when I see it from that perspective, I think of the cross. And I would have to say from the perspective of one who must go to the cross in order for sin to be forgiven, that forgiving sins is much more difficult. Isn't it so? Is there any argument against that? For Jesus to forgive our sins, for God to forgive us our sins. Jesus is God, and for God to give forgiveness or grant forgiveness for sin, He must die for the sin. He must become the sinner Himself. 
That's more difficult than saying, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Isn't it? And so we see why that meant more to the man who is no longer walking on this earth than having his physical needs met. Did the man need to be healed? Not to go to heaven. Did he need to be healed? Well, life's easier that way, wouldn't it be? Jesus' simple answer is that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. So he said, just so that you can know that my forgiving sins is valid, get up and take up your bed and go to your house. And the guy did. Let me ask a second question that Jesus didn't ask. Which is possible for God? Forgiving sins or healing physical ailments? Which one? They're both possible for God. Which is easier for God? Well, I think healing, physical healing is easier. It doesn't come at the cost. Which is possible for God? Because of Jesus, my friend, both. Both. But in order for our sins to be forgiven us, my friend, do not forget that Jesus must needs die on the cross. It's the only way for sin to be forgiven. And do you think that's easy? It's impossible for me. It's impossible for you. And my friend, is for God Himself, it's the greatest sacrifice that's ever made. And if you're going to report on something that Jesus did and something that Jesus said, I would say this one here belongs in the Scripture, don't you think? Because it gives us a picture of what is great in the eyes of God. And it gives us a picture of who Jesus Christ is and why He came. In the same chapter of the Scripture, we see another purpose statement by Jesus. In verse 13, the Bible, or verse 12, this is when they're asking Jesus, why are you eating with lowlifes? He's just gone by Matthew, the publican, and he's called him to be a disciple. And then he's gone to his house and he's eating with a bunch of sinful people. And their question is, Jesus, why are you hanging around these kind of people? This shouldn't be God's crowd. If you're God, and they knew he was God, this shouldn't be your crowd. And Jesus' response to them was, this is why I came. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. It's tragic when any person sees themselves as not having a need for forgiveness. Isn't it? It's tragic because the fact is, is that whether they see their need or not, they still have it. You know the person who's going to die from an ailment is a person who never recognizes he's sick. Ignores the signs never seeks help, never acknowledges. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, the Christian science thing is just such an evil cult. It's one of the reasons because, you know, wellness is in the mind. You don't have a physical problem. You have a mental problem. You just need to believe you're well. My friend, if you've got a physical problem and you believe you're well, you're going to die from it. That's just evil. But the evil in it is the arrogance. Because the arrogance in it actually says, I don't need... God. And any person who doesn't acknowledge their sin, any person who thinks, you know, these people are bad and I'm not like them, is a person who cannot see their need. The reason any person comes to Jesus and receives Him for their Savior is because they see themselves as sinners. If you're here today and you'd say, you know what, I'm a church-going person, can't you see? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a sinner. I go to church. I'm religious. I, I've, you ask my family. I've always been a good person. My friend, that person will die in their sins. I'm not saying there's a virtue in wickedness, but a person who knows they're a sinner is a person who knows their need. And Jesus said, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. He is not saying, you know... You Pharisees who think you're so wonderful, you don't need me. 
What he's talking about is not their actual need. He's talking about their perceived need. And they do not recognize that they actually need a Savior. They think that those people don't deserve a Savior. <laughs> and it's ironic because you only need a Savior if you're a sinner. You only need a Savior if you're a sinner. My friend, Jesus is nothing to you if you're not a sinner. I'm not saying Jesus is nothing because you are a sinner and you need Him, but if you won't acknowledge it, He's nothing to you. And that, that'll do you no earthly good. And you'll never make it to heaven. It's good for us, isn't it, to be reminded of why Jesus came? The Gospel of Matthew, who presents Jesus as the King of the Jews, first of all, helps us to understand the reason Jesus came was to forgive sin. And the means Jesus had in order to forgive sin was that He became sin and died for sinners. That's why He came. You're reporting on Jesus, eyewitness news. And you're reporting on the three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry. And you wish to tell a story and to show something Jesus did that encapsulates who He is and why He came. Is there anything better than the story of the man who came to Jesus sick of the palsy? And everybody thinks he came because he wanted to be physically healed. But actually he came because he needed to be spiritually healed and forgiven for his sins. And incidentally, Jesus did both. My friend, that's the kind of a Savior Jesus is. He's the kind of a Savior who knows your actual need and who always meet that actual need. Your actual need is the same need the man sick of the palsy had. Your actual need is that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And then you have the beautiful picture of a Jesus who's able to do things you don't even need. I'm not trying to be humble and I'm not trying to be arrogant saying I could put my myself in the place of the man sick of the palsy. But if I were asked, would you like to be healed? I think my answer would be, I don't really need to be. I'm fine because my sins have been forgiven me. That's all I need. Actually. I didn't ask that. Would you like to be healed? Well, yes, I would. Well, it's coincidental that the person who's able to forgive your sins is the kind of person who's just kind and good and does things that we don't even need because that's the kind of a Savior Jesus is. Isn't that wonderful? Here's a man who needed forgiveness for sin. He got that and Jesus said, oh, take this one home with you as well. You ever got the bonus package? You ever go to a restaurant and they give you food and they say, oh, you know what? Try this. That happens to me quite a bit. I think people look at me and be like, you know what? The man needs to eat. You know? Uh, I've, it just seems funny. I'll be at a restaurant people say, oh, you know what? We've got a new dish. I'd like you to try this. Or, you know what? This is really good. We were in Arkansas last summer eating with Melissa's uncle and my brother and his wife and Melissa. And we were, we'd gone to church and we were eating lunch after Sunday after church. And the lady just wanted us to try their restaurant's mashed potatoes. So she brought us out mashed potatoes. You know, well, we're not going to charge you. Let's just try these, you know. These are extra. Uh, I've been places where it's just like, keep it on there. And you know, you think that's the kind of place you want to go. Man, they give you what you paid for and then they give you more. Well, Jesus gave the man what he needed and he said, well, here, you know, have some more. Have some more. My friend, that's blessing, isn't it? Isn't that the way God works? God saved you, but he didn't just save you. He gave you a wonderful life to live with the purpose. And we could go on about the package. But that's the kind of Savior Jesus is. Father... Today we can only recognize, understand, and admire you because of the kind of a God you are and the kind of a Savior Jesus is. God, today we recognize that there's nothing redeemable in us. There's nothing worthwhile or value in each of us. And yet Christ died for us because you're a loving God. And when we see this, we can only marvel and be amazed at the kind of a God you are and the kind of Savior Jesus is. God, I pray if there's an individual here today 
that would not see themselves, not see their problems as being a problem of sin, but <laughs> instead see their problem as something that they lack or something physical that's wrong. Well, I pray that you'd help them to see from the same perspective as the man sick of the palsy. And then, God, I just pray that you just meet all their needs in a way that recognizes how good you are. Before I begin or finish praying this morning, I'd like to ask that you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And I'd just like to ask a couple of personal questions that I don't think you'd want to share the answers of with other people. So I want to ask a question, first of all. The first question would be this. It may be that you've come here today and you've never recognized that sin condemns you, that if you were judged because of your sin, <coughs> you would be an eternal en enemy of God. And you would have eternal consequences for that. And as you look at why Jesus came, you've recognized that Jesus came to die for my sin. If you never trusted Jesus as your Savior, and you recognize that, or you see that truth, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I don't know for sure that I have eternal life. Would you just slip up your hand? Just slip up your hand. Uh, just say, Pastor, pray for me. If I were to die today, I'd die in my sin. I've never been forgiven by Jesus for my sin. Okay? Second question today would be this. If you know that you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, and you say, well, Pastor, you know, sometimes I don't recognize my greatest need. Sometimes I tend to think, like most people do, that my physical problems are my greatest problems, and in thinking that way, I overlook the truth that my spiritual problems are much more the area where I have need than the physical needs that I have. And God's shown me that today. My greatest need is spiritual, not physical. And God's changed my perspective on that, and I'm going to do business with Him about some things in particular. If that's you, God showed you that today from the Scripture. Just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, you know, God showed me that. I want to witness. I, just slip your hand up, slip it right back down. God showed me that, and I want to witness, okay? How, how about it? Anyone else? I want to have God's perspective on what my actual needs are. Okay? If God's spoken these things to several of us, then let's just take a minute. Let's we'll have a moment of silence, and then I'll finish our prayer, and uh, we'll sing a song of invitation. Uh, we'll do, actually just sing a song to conclude the service uh, today. Let's, let's just do business. God spoke to you about that. We just pray to Him right now, just right where you sit at. Just do business with Him very privately. God, thank you for showing us today that our physical need is not our great need. It's actually our spiritual need. And I pray that you would help us to live in, in light of that perspective. God, on the other hand, I'm so thankful that you're not a God who, as the Scripture says, that Jesus, we don't have a Savior who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. God, I thank you that we can go to you and we can find grace, we can find mercy when we have needs. And Lord, when our needs are physical instead of spiritual, I thank you that you're a God that does care about that. I pray that you would continue to allow us, by your grace, to have physical needs and then to meet those needs so that we would depend on you and recognize our spiritual need first. Help us with this perspective now. Change our lives and our hearts as a result of what we've learned. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being here this morning. I think it would be appropriate to go ahead and uh, sing a song. Uh, for by way of concluding, I'd like to sing uh, page 213, The Light of the World is Jesus. That will be our final song day. If you'd stand to your feet, we'll sing page 213, The Light of the World is Jesus. Mm -hmm.